follower. I shall build and not destroy. I will raise up a standard and not become the status quo. I will walk in the fullness of the love of the Holy Spirit. I have overcome. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another episode of She Merged, the manifestation of me. I'm your host, Shalomar. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Um, as always, I appreciate your continued support. I pray that you are receiving these messages as they are intended. I pray that you are encouraged and empowered uh, by me sharing my journey and my story. Um, I am preparing for the release of my first written work. Uh, she emerged the manifestation of me. Um, prayerfully, uh, pre-sales will begin June 21st of 2021. I'm excited uh, for all that God is doing um, in my life and where he's taking me. And I pray that this is encouraging you to go on a journey of healing um, of your own. Um, and if you're already in the journey, I pray that it is helping you. Um, if you've not begun your journey, I pray that it is encouraging and empowering you to start the journey. Um, and I, I, I've, I'm here. Um, get into the comments. I love to engage with you all. Uh, I love the feedback. Um, I'm just like so excited and nervous because this book is like my story. Um, there are some things in there that I've really not spoken about to many, if any. Uh, and so I just pray that it is received well um, and that it serves its purpose. So in my last episode, uh, we I started the conversation of the disconnect between black mothers and their daughters. Um, I feel that that is an important conversation to have. I felt that it was important to stimulate the conversation. Some of you all may be able to identify and some of you may not, but for those who um, were in need of that little push to uh, start the conversation um, and begin to heal from those traumas, uh, I, I wish you well on your journey and I, I pray that it is working out for you. So, on today, <laughs> let's talk about it a little more um, because that is a very layered conversation. Um, and I don't, I don't want to just start the conversation and drop the ball. Um, so, you know, my goal is to really keep the conversation going um, and, and, you know, stimulate it in such a way um, that it is effective um, in some way, shape or form. And again, it's always me sharing my experiences with you um, and, and being candid about the things that I have overcome. So I left off um, sort of just touching on um, how young Black women are reared to just be matriarchal um, and how um, the African-American Black culture is driven by a very patriarchal makeup. Um, so let's touch on the on the silent topic. So let's, let's touch on some things that are um, not spoken about as much, but need to be spoken about a lot. I saw a post on Facebook that said, um, a lot of families will embrace the child molester and ridicule the homosexual. Now this one is touching. Um, but I'm going to stay in my lane on this one. Um, from my own experience, I believe that to be true. Uh, a lot of young Black women will come to their families, their elders, the people that are charged with uh, protecting them and keeping them safe, 
and express to them that someone has hurt them in a way, uh, touched them inappropriately, been inappropriate with them in a sexual manner. And as I've stated before, the initial response is always, um, in my experience, well, what did you do? Or they have a family conversation and there are no consequences um, for the perpetrator. Having been in that situation, um, I take a firm stance on when it comes to that. Um, a lot of times our children are not protected when it comes to that. A lot of times the families will rally around the perpetrator, demean, disregard, and ignore the victim. And it is just basically a cycle of re-victimization. They make excuses for the behavior, they justify the behavior, and always at the expense of the victim that child is then subject to continuously having to be in the presence of the person who violated them. It makes them vulnerable um, to a repeat offense. And sometimes the abuse can go on for years because families refuse to acknowledge that it's happened. Sometimes it, it's, they just don't wanna deal with it. Uh, or it's so ingrained in them that they have mentally checked out and can no longer see the, the harm or wrong in it because it is it can be generational. Um, and I'll say this, oftentimes they're not based on the statistics and the information available. Um, on uh, you know a lot of the, the children's um, protection websites and uh, sexual abuse um, blotters um, in, in my research, the perpetrator has usually been at some point a victim themselves. So in my research from my own families, uh, the elders, the great, great, greats um, at some point were victimized um, either during slavery or uh, on sharecropper farms and the situations of that nature. And it mentally damaged them. And so they carry that on into their lineage and it becomes a generational trauma. Um, and a generational curse. And so it becomes a common occurrence in the families and it becomes so common um, that it's not looked at so much as something that is wrong, but as a norm. Um, and that should never be. Uh, so where do we go and begin to correct this and for me, it stops with me. Um, that's not normal to me. And no, you can't do that to my children. And no, I'm not gonna look the other way. Um, we gonna have a problem. And it takes courage because a lot of times it will end up being you against the entire family. And you have to make a decision on if you and it, it, it should be an easy decision, but we all know that it's not on you literally walking away from your family, what you've known um, to protect yourself and your offspring and change the course of that generational curse and that generational trauma. Um, How do you gently, uh, respectfully, and lovingly, um, because God says we must do all things in love, 
um, address this issue when it is you against the world. That's a tough spot to be in. And again, I can only speak from my own, own experiences um, over the years during my childhood when I brought certain things to the attentions um, of the adults. And you have to read my book to get the details. Um, or my publisher is going to kill me. Um, <laughs> you, I was ostracized. I was considered the black sheep of the family. They ridiculed me. They persecuted me. I was considered the black sheep. I was told that um, I was mean. I was too sassy. Well, I talked too much and I just needed to mind um, the adults. Well, if the adults are the ones that are doing something to me that I don't like that you know is wrong, then don't teach me to bow down to that behavior. And so what that what that did was it caused me to basically retreat into myself. Um, and eventually I just stopped. I stopped expressing myself. I stopped um, reaching out for help from people that I, I at that point realized were not going to help me. They were more interested in protecting their family image and the family name um, than they were interested in protecting me, the, the helpless child who couldn't really defend themselves. Um, I remember clearly being told I was a liar, um, demonized, punished, um, and at some point ostracized uh, for speaking out. Um, and that was very hurtful. And I carried that into my adult life. And it caused me to put a lot of distance. See, I didn't fold into, I ran away from um, the family because I can't trust you. You don't have my best interests at heart. You're not here to protect me. And because I never felt protected or validated um, in my, my hurts, I ended up running into situations that meant me no good trying to escape what meant me no good. And it ended up being a vicious cycle of me just walking into situations, um, relationships, situationships that caused me more harm than good because I was trying to escape what didn't mean me any good. Um, I was put in positions to where I had to um, be in rooms and spaces with people that had done me wrong and everybody was like embracing the person and loving on this person and I'm just like they are gross and then not only that you continue to send other children in the space with this person and to this day there's been no accountability. Um, and it was just overlooked. And I don't think families, not all, some, um, realize the irreparable, irreparable harm that that does to a child um, and the weight that, that, that you have to carry. Um, in those situations and how hard it is to overcome that on your own without the support. Um, and it's bigger than just the assault. Um, as I spoke on before, it's the language that's used towards you that damages you, um, the blame, you know, if I'm seven, what could I really be doing? Um, to create a situation like that. Um, I'm a child and the responsibility ultimately lies with the adults um, and not on me, but it's easier. They find it easier to displace that on the children um, as the scapegoat and again, re-victimizing them over and over and over and over again. Um, and as you grow and you develop into a young adult, 
um, because you've been subjected to that. You, the lines are often blurred between predators um, and, and healthy relationships and healthy situationships. Uh, and so I found myself um, in quite a few inappropriate relationships and situationships. Um, another common thing that I myself have experienced um, in being a, a young black woman is that the age lines are so blurred um, that what is considered today um, taboo was not considered taboo when I was younger. It was okay to be in a relationship or situationship with someone who was older than you significantly um, because the lines were so blurred as far as age. A lot of times we didn't even look at it like that. Um, and because as young black women, we're oftentimes denied those conversations um, and the rules are so complicated when it comes to our upbringing and rearing, we just kind of fall in line. So either we're naive and confused or we are running and we run right into the brick wall. So, you know, there was a time in my life when I found myself in a relationship that was highly inappropriate um, because I was super naive. Um, and nobody really ever had the conversation with me. And because in my community, the lines of age were so blurred and it was so common um, that it was looked at as a normalcy. Um, but I thank God for revelation because unfortunately what I survived, my children will never go through because I was able to teach them better but not because anybody who was supposed to have taught me taught me, but because life lessons taught me. And I feel like those are things that need to be addressed. No, a 20 year old has no business in the face of a 14 year old. Um, none, that's not dating. Uh, that's not a relationship. That's a mental illness. And I remember being tagged in a conversation on social media, okay? When the R. Kelly thing became really, really huge um, and, and the things that, that he is alleged to have done, because it's allegedly, I don't know, I wasn't there. Um, there was a conversation stimulated amongst my peers and I was tagged. I was tagged by um, a guy that I was in an inappropriate relationship with. And he tagged me in the conversation with the hopes that I was going to somehow vindicate him. It's a no, sir. Hindsight is twenty twenty. And all I could do was be honest and say, although I do not believe your intentions were malicious, um, it was still wrong. And because of the way as a young, a young man, he was encouraged to run out and do all these things. And because he had acquired, you know, certain things, um, it was overlooked greatly that he was habitual um, with dating women, young girls, girls, not even women, let's just call it what it is, dating young girls who he had no business. I don't even know if you can call that dating. Child, he was messing with folks he had no business messing with. And I happen to be one of them because why? Nobody, I, I had my own set of issues. Um, and what I will say was it was really strange because 
I can never say he was never abusive to me, um, although abusive to me. He was, uh, he never physically abused me. I hit back anyway. And what was so weird about it was he treated me as if I was his age. I was 14. And when he and I, and, and I said this on the post, and I was like, sir, unfortunately, I can't defend your actions. But what I will say is this. Um, and I, I kind of broke it down to him. I said, what you engaged in was considered grooming because at 14, I was not um, sexually active. I was actually very petrified. Um, and I had my own set of issues because I am a sexual abuse survivor. So I was not interested in that. Um, and so, and I was very firm in that because at that point I had become very overprotective of myself and my no was a no. And so what I've, you know, now learned in my adult age was what he engaged in was considered grooming. But what I found so surprising was he was so ignorant to it. Um, and he was naive to it, as was I. And so I did not find his actions malicious because they were not. He genuinely was under the impression that he had done nothing wrong because he treated me well. He never just, you know, did anything malicious to me. Um, he was respectful of my no, uh, but he did groom me. We would sit in the car in front of my house for hours and talk. Um, we would go out to eat. And again, I was 14 and we had Red Lobster, like literally dating. That was so inappropriate, but nobody around me found that inappropriate. Nobody around me saw any issue with that. Um, that this grown man who could drive, meanwhile, I couldn't do anything but ride a bike, was courting me. And so when I responded to what he said and I explained to him in the best way possible that, sir, it, it wasn't appropriate, um, you were grooming me um, and it was wrong. He was very confused. And so he reached out to me privately after putting me on blast publicly, um, expecting a different answer. And because again, I couldn't, I could not validate him um, in his behavior. It was wrong. And he reached out to me privately and he did apologize. And what he said to me was, I didn't think I did anything wrong. Um, I was genuinely interested in you and I thought that was okay. And everybody around me was doing it and nobody ever questioned it. And I found that sad because now here he is uh, being honest about his lack of understanding and lack of knowledge. And I, I had to sit with it myself and I realized that it was a very common occurrence um, in, in, in our community for older guys to pursue us. And they never saw any wrong in what they were doing because nobody around them told them it was wrong. What they were doing was emulating what they had seen for years. And because nobody ever thought that it was wrong to operate like this, it just carried on from generation to generation. And so it was a double-edged sword for me because now you have this young man who wasn't aware that he was doing anything wrong because nobody ever taught him different. So he didn't see any wrong with it. And it was the mindset and he getting his hind parts handed to him on social media. I felt kind of bad. Um, but at the same time, I did bring to his attention, you have daughters. At what point 
did you not think about how you would feel if someone did the same thing to your daughters? You would have a fit. And I know this to be true. At what point did you not recognize that you had children while we were in this situation? Um, that a 14, 15 year old girl could be somebody's stepmom when she was still trying to sit up underneath her mama. And even for myself, I was just like, now child, you, what, what was you thinking? But the mental space that I was in, uh, it allowed me to walk right into this situation. And again, because it, for my own self, it was also common for me. So I didn't see anything wrong with it, but it was absolutely wrong. And in my naivety, I believe that because he never pressured me to have sex and he was patient with my no and he treated me well and, you know, he was taking me out to eat and I you know, we were sitting at restaurants. I wasn't a secret. We were out and about um, to some degree. <sighs> there were other issues, though. And it was just a lot of foolishness um, that I was doing something. I wouldn't do nothing. I was silly um, and misinformed and damaged and broken. And nobody around me corrected it. And the people who were supposed to be protecting me were well aware um, of what was going on. And that was damaging. I wasn't even at a place where I knew how to love myself. So I most certainly didn't know how to love a grown man. And he was grown, grown. Right? He was like 24 or something like that at the time. Um, and this is not to bash him, but this is to bring to uh, to light a conversation that needs to be had. Some we have to change that that thought process, that thinking, um, because although now uh, people give it more thought because of the R. Kelly situation, um, that mindset is still there. It's not like they're still doing it; they're just doing it in private. And it was not healthy. And I was unfortunately not the only one. And our community at, as a whole just kind of overlooked and embraced the idea that it was okay for older guys to, to solicit younger girls. And because as we're brought up as young women, we're taught that, you know, he should buy you stuff and he should treat you well and you know this that and the third a predator is a predator is a predator and it doesn't matter how nice of a predator they are uh they're still a predator and my heart went out to him because again he was never cruel to me my heart went out to him because of the lack of knowledge that has now landed him in a spot to be publicly ringed and ridiculed um, because nobody corrected that. And because there is this patriarchal makeup where our boys are encouraged to collect all the notches on their belts that they can. Um, and so they go out there and they do that and nobody really checks them. Um, and because some families normalize sexual assault and abuse, a lot of times situations and things like that are overlooked. And we have to do better with our girls. We have to do better with um, giving young black women permission to speak, permission to feel. Um, permission to feel safe 
we have to change the narrative of how we address them, how we validate them, how we encourage them and how we empower them. Because if somebody had validated me, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't all, you know, my, my father's mother always told me I was beautiful, but there were just conversations that I needed to have to know better that, that were not given to me. And we have to change that. Um, recently, I'll tell you this. Um, my daughter went out, she went to a function. This young man is a friend of hers. They went to school together. They, it was a celebration for him his mother gave him. His girlfriend felt some type of way about somebody my daughter was with. It wasn't my daughter, it was somebody that she was with. His mother, not knowing who to target, ended up targeting my daughter. She came out, she like totally disrespected and demeaned, and demeaned my daughter um, in the most horrible way. And her stance was she berated her, called her out of her name. You just want my son, blah, 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 blah. Um, you're not going to be out here disrespecting his girlfriend, blah, 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 that whole thing. And I'm just like, why didn't you address your son? Because if that was the case and your son is in a relationship and he's grown, let's be clear, my, my daughter's 21. So this young man is grown, his girlfriend is grown. Your response, if that young lady felt some type of way uh, about her relationship being threatened, your response shouldn't have been to come outside and publicly demean my child. It should have been to correct your son about his flirtatious, flirtatious behavior because his responsibility is to the young lady he's in the relationship with. So why not use that as a teachable moment to teach your son how to appropriately carry himself when he's in a relationship, to teach your son how to have more respect for the relationship that he's in, and to teach that young lady how to address her mate and, and appropriate conflict resolution. No, your response was to come outside and demean the young lady who you thought was the problem um, and publicly ridicule her. Why did that response come so easy to you? And why is that the automatic response? Now she did call and apologize because it was a mix up. It wasn't my daughter she intended to come for. But even if it wasn't my daughter, even if it was somebody else's child, why was that the immediate response? Why not correct your son? Why not pull him to the side? That was a teachable moment to teach him how a young man is supposed to carry themselves when in a relationship, to teach him to have respect for the woman that he's in relationship with. And unfortunately, that is the common response when it comes to these things. And we really have to change that narrative. We really do. Because that ties into my situation. Nobody ever corrected that young man. They bigged up his behavior. It was a pat on the back. It was saw as um, an accomplishment. And it never dawned on anybody to correct him to say, no, that is not an accomplishment. That's not an accomplishment to um, be going around trying to be in relationship with, with young women and girls who are six, seven years your junior. You've got no business being 24 in the face of a 14 year old. It's inappropriate, but a lot of times that is not the response. And I can tell you that there were moments when people did address it when I was younger. They never addressed the guys always antagonize the girls. You run around here being fast. You ain't got no business in that man's face. Well, guess what? How about you teach her to value herself so that she won't be susceptible to a predator? How about you teach her the difference 
in a healthy and unhealthy relationship so she knows that that ain't it. But those are conversations that are often lacking when it comes to our young women and girls. And so they go out naive into the world and they become victims and they end up staying in relationships and situationships that they shouldn't be in. They follow patterns and emulate things that they've seen in the home because they've watched their mothers be beaten by their fathers or stepfathers or boyfriends. And because mom never has the courage to say to her daughter, yes, I'm in this situation and I'm trying to find my way out, but this is not what love looks like. Because they're oftentimes too embarrassed to even address, address it. Yes, because in my time, being married at a young age was common because it was out of necessity, sometimes even to save my life, that doesn't have to be your reality. Because it wasn't oh, even okay for me, it was out of necessity, but that necessity is not there for you. That's not a necessity for you, but they don't. They're ashamed and because of their own self-imposed shame, won't have the conversations. And so our girls are going out into the world. They're not empowered. They don't feel valued. They don't feel validated. And this vicious cycle just keeps going on. And now we have generations of baby mamas. It's being glorified to be a side chick. It is common to be the other woman and sometimes celebrated. And that is a lie. You deserve a love of your own. You deserve to be the only one. You deserve to be the apple of his eye and have his total affection. And it is possible, possible to have a man to love you for you and love only you and give you what you need. And yes, your needs matter and you have the right. You have the right to say what you will and you will not tolerate. You deserve to be treated well. You deserve to be loved appropriately and properly. What you don't deserve is to be demeaned, to be hit, to be gaslit, to be mistreated. You don't deserve that. You deserve to have your feelings validated. You deserve to be told. You deserve to know and understand that you are worthy of love. You deserve to know and understand that you are worthy of happiness. You deserve to live and not simply exist. Your body is your temple and you have the right to say no. You have the right to dictate the terms of your life and not feel shame about it. You have the right to walk with your head held high, regardless to what your circumstances are. You matter. And you may not matter to some, but as long as you matter to you, you matter. Nobody has the right to take anything from you. And that includes your dignity. Nobody has the right to infringe their own beliefs and actions upon you. And that includes putting their hands on you in a way that you did not invite. I don't care if you walking around in a mini skirt with no drawers on. I wouldn't advise that. The wind blow the wrong way, you won't have a problem. But even if you did, that is not an open invitation for anybody to invade your space. It's not. I don't care what great grandma, grandma, I don't care what they allow. 
you don't have to allow it. And if you go to those adults and you say, this is what happened and they don't listen, then you keep going until you get somebody who will listen because that is not okay. And we have got to do better at addressing the issue of sexual assault, sexually inappropriate behavior and molestation in the black community. It is not okay. We are creating generations of broken and emotionally damaged and stunted young women by overlooking this behavior. Stop victim shaming. No, that seven-year-old child didn't invite that behavior. No, that 13-year-old did not invite that behavior. It is not their fault. And we have to come out of the mindset that it is. And then you don't put two and two together and they grow up and they become either extremely promiscuous or extremely withdrawn. And we're not taking responsibility for the part that, that we played in creating that mindset in them. And when they go out and they go to the left and they're extremely promiscuous, we're bashing them, calling them whores and tramps and using the B word to demean and degrade them. But maybe had you listened, when they came to you and expressed that somebody was doing something to them inappropriately, instead of making excuses for the behavior, instead of sweeping it under the rug, instead of victim shaming them, they would have had a healthier mindset and they wouldn't feel the need to go out and fill a void that was created by your lack of protection, acknowledgement, and validation. So I'm gonna stop right there, Lord have mercy. And we will pick this conversation up again at another time. As always, I thank you for listening. I pray that this conversation is received in the way that it is intended. I hope that you got something out of it. I pray that this encourages and stimulates um, a movement of normalizing, protecting, our girls, encouraging and empowering them. They need us and they matter. And until we start to teach them that they matter, they won't know and understand. And part of you learning and knowing the skills to teach them that they matter is gonna start with you healing from your own trauma and not displacing that on our daughters. So God bless you. Have a great day. I appreciate you for watching. I'm excited. I can't wait for the book to come out. She emerged the manifestation of me. Pre-sale should start June 21st. Check out my sister Tamita Brockington's book, Marriage is Not a Fairy Tale, available right now at tamitabrockington.wixsite.com. My sister Lisa V. Tate Stevenson um, at Lisa V. Tate Stevenson.com. Oh, I think it's a dot org. I done tore that all the way up. Um, <clears throat> her book, uh, Have You Ever Heard a Butterfly Cry, touches on this and so much more. Um, check these ladies out. We are changing the game, we are breaking generational curses, we are killing the stigma of generational trauma. It is a new day and there's a new movement. God is raising up a standard and we are the generation that's gonna open up our mouths and make it known that we are not here for the foolishness anymore. It is time to change a lot of things in order for us as a community and as a people to truly evolve. And I hope you're down for the evolution because it most certainly will be televised. The manifestation has begun. Let's emerge, ladies. As always, the sun rises alone every day and still manages to shine. The moon rises every night alone and still manages to light someone's way. Be the lights. 
light someone's way, even if you're doing it alone, it's okay. You matter, you're capable, you are loved, you are able, launch the vision, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you for watching. More than a conqueror, I am a victor. I am a leader, not a follower. I shall build and not destroy.